door. Do you happen to have a match? Uh, uh, uh. Say, where do you come from? This building is closed. Thank you. We'll have you the correct time. Uh. It is just to nine o'clock. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, still, I don't understand. Uh, Death was caused by strangulation, Inspector. The murderer had powerful hands, and he knew what he was doing. How long has he been dead? I'd say about an hour. What's your name? Uh, Luigi Bacigalupa. All right, Louis. What do you know about this? Me? I don't know nothing. I only know what I say over the phone. Well, let's have your story. Well, I knew something terrible was going to happen tonight. So you knew something, huh? Oh, right. What's this happen? Why, there's been a... Oh, yeah. I see. Hello, Casey. Come on, Casey, give. I got a date with Inspector Riley. Sure you have. Only Riley don't know it. You go on in and tell him. Then he will know it. Come on, scram. Now, you know Riley always let me in on a murder. How'd you know this was a murder? Easy. I made a quick check up on the population of the city and found out we were one short. Yeah? Well, if you don't get out of here, we're going to be two short. Ah, uh -huh, you admit it. I'd be victim number two, so who was number one? Garfield. Garfield. Where did I read something about him today? Now listen here. I remember. The Garfield Investment Company was petitioned into bankruptcy this morning. Another stockbroker gone in the way of all flesh. Another stockbroker? Say, Casey, run in and tell Riley I gotta see him. I got a clue. But I... Come on now, Casey, oh, come on. on. I'm sorry, sir, but that Burton guy from the Chronicle is outside. You mean inside? Now listen. All right, Casey. All right, boy. What are you doing here, Burton? Well, you know I always tag along with you on all your unsolved murders. I just thought I'd come along to see that you didn't break the record. Is that so? Well, don't break anything on this story till I tell you to, or there'll be trouble. Ah, you know me. All right, Casey. Hmm. Strangled, huh? Just like the other cases. Yeah. That's not the only similarity, either. When the murderer was leaving the building, he asked the janitor for a match and the time. Yeah. The fourth case we've had just like this in a month, clues are all the same and they lead no place. I think we've got a clue. What do you mean? There's the fact taken residence in your cranium that Garfield is a stockbroker and that the other three victims of the recent murder cases were also stockbrokers. Where does that get us? Why, oh, gives a tip on the kind of man to look for. Instead of wasting your time on thugs, you can concentrate on the clients of Garfield and the other stockbrokers. Hey, if we're going to suspect everybody in this country that saw them stockbrokers, we're going to be getting out indictments for half the population of the United States. <laughs> Hogan's right, as usual. Your theorizing's okay, kid, but I'm with the inspector. We've got to start with Bucci Galacci or Lachi. Oh, Louie. 
He got a swell peek at this guy as he left the building. I'm going to take him down to headquarters and let him drag an eye through the rogues' gallery. Rest the men from the homicide squad are here, sir. Send them in. All right, boys. Hi, gang. Doc, let me have a record of your tops as soon as you can. Give right. me a complete photographic record of everything. Footprints, fingerprints, the whole works. Yes, sir. If we fall down on this case, we're through, the bunch of us. And as for you, Mark, when you write this up, use only the barest details. I don't want them to know anything we found out. Say, Sherlock, I can write all you found out on a postage stamp. And still have room on it to do a jigsaw puzzle. Is that so? You see, now. And at the opening of the office meeting was a brilliant success, is shown by the number of socially and financially prominent people who attended. The beautiful Mrs. Leland Grace Whitner lent a charming presence and was attired in a severe white evening gown covered by a Norman wrap. The lovely Miss Myrtle Hempstead was there also. And she wore a gown... Running pants, football cleat, and a spray of rhubarb. And a good time was had by all, because our worthless reporter from the Chronicle favored the gathering by his absence. As to what he was wearing, he was just wearing on everyone. <laughs> How many times have I asked you not to spoil my record? About as many times I've asked you to marry me. <laughs> Only up and up, Jerry. How about it? Do we get a place and raise some chickens? What do you say? Oh, Jack, I have so much to do. Go away. There you are. Marry me and I'll do all your work for you. I overheard the city editor say this morning that as far as your work was concerned, now you better snap into it. Oh, yeah? For you, Miss Green. Thanks. Love letter, huh? No, it's from Mother. Same old thing. Doctors, bills. I just can't seem to get anywhere. You're carrying too much of a load, kid. Why don't you let me help you? No, Jack. I couldn't do that. But if we got married, I'd have the right the to. The right to let me saddle you with all my burdens. Is that it? Say, nothing connected with you could be a burden. You know I'm crazy about you. You've got enough on your shoulders looking after yourself, Jack. What's the matter? Don't you think I'm going to get any place? Not unless you settle down to some sort of serious work. You know, you can write a story with more punch and drama than anybody else in the game. Yet all you do is waste your time on sensationalism. Murder, kidnapping, frame up, scandal. Well, these guys like Winchell don't do so bad. You're no Winchell, yes. Say, the only difference between me and Winchell is that he's been around more places than I have. And I'm catching up on him fast. Mm-hmm, yeah. <clears throat> what do you think of the swell little murder we had last night, huh? Now, there you are. You would think that a murder were a show or something. Well, uh, this one's gonna be a show. It'll rock the town before it's through. Well, well, Philo Vance himself, in person. Good morning, Miss Crane. Good morning, Hogan. A little bit out of my precinct this morning, but I feel awful good just having solved the Garfield murder. You solved it? Why, you credit-snatching flatfoot? You know it was my idea to have the janitor look through the pictures in the morgue room. Say, if I hadn't agreed to Bucci Gerbeck, Louis coming down to the Chronicle, what good would your hunch have been? You mean they've caught Garfield's murder? Yeah, got him in jail now. Congratulations, Mr. Hogan. That was pretty quick work, wasn't it? Well, listen to me, they had that guy in the who's gone six hours sooner. Say, hey, what's the matter with you? I come down here to tip you off to a scoop and you treat me like a relative or something. All right, how much is it going to cost me? That is outside my car and my next year's salary. No, I, I just wanted to see if you got the name right. Terrence Aloysius Hogan. All right, Hogan. You're not a bad guy. I guess you deserve a break. Yeah, spell that uh, little name right. It's A-L-O-Y-S-I-U-S, Aloysius. Sure. How could I miss it? Aloysius. Uh, on the way down, I picked up a picture. Thought you might need it. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I could have got one from the morgue room, but probably there's a later picture. Yeah, that's a later one. It's, uh... 
Say, what is this? I, th I thought you were going to give me a picture of the murderer. Why, if I we print this, there are prosecutors for libel in the human race. Why don't you let this crane run it in the society cover? You can say, hey, listen. When Riley hears about this, you won't get within 10 miles of the next murder. All this guy does is run around solving crimes and taking the credit away from the police. Uh, <laughs> he means well, but he just ain't bright. Say, kid, what do you know about this big shot brain, anyway? You mean your own brain? Yeah, that's the baby. He's been giving the socialites an awful play lately. More on your line than mine. Well, I haven't got time to look him up in the files just now. Let me see. He came to town about, oh, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Bought the Tucker estate. Mm. Everybody likes him. He's given thousands of dollars to charity and all that sort of thing. Boy, what a yarn for the front page this will make. What's Bream been doing to get himself in the front page? Oh, he's the guy that killed Garfield and a few others, probably. Why, Jack, that's ridiculous. Jerome Breen isn't the sort of man who would murder anyone. No? Well, Louis, the janitor, possibly identified him as the man who was prowling around the building the night Garfield was strangled. Have you seen Mr. Breen? What does he say? Sure, I was with the squad when they picked him up. Naturally denies it, they always do. Um, Jack, I think it's terrible to arrest a prominent man like Mr. Breen on so little evidence. Yeah? Well, we're gonna have a whole lot more evidence before we get through. Now I see it. Just because you and the police department have a lot of unsolved murders on your hands, you're going to pin it on a man who's done more publicity than all the police and the newspapers put together. Say. Why are you so hot for this fellow Breen, anyway? Because I know all the good he's done. The donation to charities, orphanages, hospitals. Yeah. That's a new gag nowadays. Charity covers a multitude of murders. It says here that the man the janitor identified spoke to him. Right? Right. Well, perhaps you're forgetting the fact that Jerome Breen is both deaf and dumb. No, no, I know all about that. I interviewed him once. I had a hunch that he could do something with those hands as I'd talk with him. Jack, can't you see how your work is warping your mind? Why, all you're becoming is a traffic on ruined reputation. Yep, me and Simon agree. You see? It all comes back to what I said in the first place. We're always arguing. We can never agree on anything. The only thing for us to do is to get married. With your cruel attitude towards people, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man in the world. Baby, if I were the last man in the world, I'll say you wouldn't marry me. You'd be run over in the stampede. Why, you... Evidently, the prosecuting attorney is considerably worried. says that if the prosecuting attorney has any hopes of winning the case, he should be worried. I can't hear what people are saying to him. I'll eat my hat. Oh, don't be silly, Jack. Why, all intelligent deaf people are lip readers. Oh, yeah? What do you think, Chief? Will they get a conviction? I don't know, Hogan. It's got me. All the state has to go on is the testimony of this janitor.
And every woman in town believes he's innocent. While the stuff of the president of the lady's auxiliary. And even she said that this trial was nothing more than persecution. Well, I don't blame them. They've been reading those soft soap articles of yours about poor Mr. Breen. Well, what about your story? Calling him the Sphinx and everything. Well, I... Hey, hey, hey. We go to New York now in session. The Honorable George Warren, Judge, presiding. Be seated. Continue. And uh, when I have found the body, I call up for the police. If you were to see this man again, would you recognize him? Sure. I have seen him again. You have? Where? Uh, right in this place. Order. Will you point him out to us, Luigi? Sure. That's him, down there. Order. You're quite sure that you couldn't be mistaken? Sure. I saw him with my own eyes, and I heard him with my own ears. That's all. Your witness. Mr. Betsy Galupi, have you ever had hallucinations? Come again? <laughs> Order. I mean, do you ever imagine that you hear things or see things? Your Honor, object. Object is the same. Mr. Bachigalupi, you are positive that you heard Mr. Breen speak to you? Yes, sir. Suppose I should prove that it would be impossible for Mr. Breen to speak. Was you there? <laughs> Order. What would you say if I tell you that we're going to prove that Mr. Breen is deaf and dumb? I say you were a screwy. <laughs> Order. You uh, take a drink now and then, don't you? Sure. Uh, I have the cold almost all of the time. Mm. Mm. It was cold the night of the murder, as I recall. Maybe you took a few drinks of whiskey to warm you up. No, sir. No. Think now. That was six weeks ago. How can you be so sure? You mean I am sure that it wasn't a whiskey? Yes. I never took a drink of whiskey in all my life. What? It was a gin. <laughs> Order. That'll be all. Yes. Your witness, Mr. Prosecutor. Is that all with this witness? No more questions. You are excused. Huh? <laughs> Mr. Breen, can you tell us where you were on the night of the murder? Mr. Breen says that he was at home, in bed. Now, Mr. Breen, can you tell us of anybody who saw you at home on the evening in question? Mr. Breen says that I was at his house at the time. All right, Mr. Jenks. We'll get your testimony later. That will be all, Mr. Breen. Your witness. You see, if Mr. Breen was very innocent, he could have hired a flock of witnesses to prove an alibi. Yeah? And if he's the shrewd boy I think he is, that's just what he wouldn't do. Oh, Jack, I'm surprised at you. Why, this is the flimsiest evidence I've ever heard given in a murder trial. I don't give a hang about the evidence. I tell you, Louie's right. If this guy is acquitted, we're going to have some more murders. Oh, ridiculous. Your name? Augustus Calvin. Your profession? Physician and surgeon. Dr. Calvin. Doctor, have you examined Mr. Breen, the defendant? I have. Did you discover any abnormality in his physical structure? Yes. Mr. Breen can neither hear nor speak. Order. Just what, specifically, is the cause of his misfortune? Mr. Breen has paralysis of the vocal cords and the oral nerves. Well, just how long, in your opinion, has this condition existed? It was congenital. He was born with it. Order. Thank you. 
That'll be all. Your witness. The court, please. I move a recess until positions appointed by the court have had an opportunity of examining the defendant. Motion granted. Court adjourned at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I bet you're enjoying that more than any story you ever wrote. Please, Jerry, go away and let me enjoy my piece, will you? Oh, forget it, Jack. Why, well, you just had a wrong slant in the thing from the beginning. Wrong slant, huh? Say, it would take more than the decision of 12 dumb clucks to make me change my opinion. I suppose all we gotta do now is to sit back, wait for some new murders, and cheer. Oh, don't be silly. Hey, I'll be through this in a minute. How about time on the old feed bag? I'm sorry, I have an engagement. Yeah? Who's the lucky guy? You a very, very dear friend of yours. All right, who is it? Mr. Jerome Breen. Jerome Breen? Mm-hmm. Mr. Breen dropped me a note thanking me for my kindness in the articles I wrote about him during the trial. Invited me to his home. Jerry, you're not really going up that fellow's house. Why, of course I am. I talked to the boss about it, and he's going to pay me extra money for a series of articles on Breen. Listen, baby, honey, listen. I know there's something screwy about that guy. Why... The idea of you being alone with him would drive me crazy. Oh, Jack, pull yourself together. Why, well, everyone you see lately is a boogeyman. This criminal court assignment of yours must be getting on your nerves. Jerry, if you go up to that man's house, I'll... Oh, that'll be swell. Only you don't make it a habit. You, Mr. Burton? All right, son. Say, Mr. Burton, there's a question I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. Go ahead, shoot. I know all the answers except the right ones. Well, you see, I sort of been wanting you to become a great reporter, and I'd like to know how to begin. Well, son, when you find out how to begin to be a great reporter, let me know, and I'll start with you. How do you do, Miss Crane? Won't you come in, please? If you please. It's so good of you to invite me, Mr. Breen. Lovely house you have here. Mr. Breen says that the house is far lovelier for your presence. I certainly wish to congratulate you on your acquittal, Mr. Breen. The whole thing was preposterous. Mr. Breen says that your articles in the Chronicle were more effective than anything else in showing how preposterous the accusation really was. My, if these compliments continue, I'm sure I'm going to be so conceited I won't be able to write a good interview. Well, why write one then? And Mr. Breen is afraid that an interview with him will have one boring necessity. I don't understand. You will be compelled to talk about him when he feels it would be much more interesting to talk about you. 
You know, Mr. Breen, an interview always begins in the same way. Where were you born? Mr. Breen has jotted down some of the facts of his life that might be of interest to your public. You may use the material in any way you see fit. Why, this is splendid. It'll be a very good beginning to the series of articles I have in mind. Mr. Breen says, and now you have no alternative except to talk about yourself. And now, Miss Crane, if you will pardon me, I shall make the speech. I do hope Mr. Breen isn't bored. Hey, Tony. Yes, sir. Fill them up again. This, uh, three points and two peaks. Pretty good, eh? Okay, then. <laughs> There you are. Ah, thank you. Hello, Louis. Hello, Mr. Burton. <laughs> well, why don't you give up drinking gin? Uh, me first to drink the wine, then the prohibition she comes, and me and all the good American citizens drink the gin. Then the law, he says, we must drink the beer. So me, Luigi Bacigalupe, drink the beer. Have one on me, huh? No, thanks. I'm not drinking. Kind of worried. What are you worried about? I am worried too. What are you got to be worried about? I am worried how I am getting to get out of here. What do you mean? <laughs> you see, it's like this. I eat the pencil, then I get thirsty. I drink a glass of the beer, and when the glass of the beer goes down, I get hungry again, then I eat the pretzels, and I want to worry what is going to be the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's tough, all right. <laughs> hey, listen, Louis. Yeah. Are you dead sure it was Breen you were talking to the night of the Garfield murder? That's what I say in court, isn't it? Ah, I know, old man, but nobody seems to believe you. Now, uh, after all, you know, uh, you were drinking pretty heavily that night, weren't you? You might have been mistaken, huh? Say, Luigi Pachicalupe only made one mistake in his life, and I married her. <laughs> all right, now cut out the Second Avenue comedy stuff, will you, and listen to me. Maybe you did have one drink too many, huh? Maybe you were seeing things, huh? Say, a few shots of gin means to me as much as a glass of milk means to you. <laughs> I was brought up in it. I mean, uh, the gin, not the milk. <laughs> but man alive, how could it have been Breen you were talking to if he couldn't talk? Say, this is the last time I'm going to speak to you about this. I know what is what, and I know what is what not. If I have to decide, and what judges and lawyers and the like, and what I see with my own eyes, I stick to what I see with my own eyes. Say, that guy Brain is a bad egg. And anybody that gets mixed up with him is going to be in trouble sooner or later. Maybe sooner. I don't believe Mr. Breen was expecting you, Mr. Werner. Well, I've got to see him. I'll wait. All right? <laughs> but you must meet Mother sometime, Mr. Breen. I know you'd like her. <laughs> Mr. Werner's calling. Oh, I had no idea it was so late. I simply must be going. Mr. Breen says he hopes you will come often. He is very lonely. You're very kind. And it is so restful here. I'm afraid I'll wear out my welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Good afternoon, Miss Crane. Goodbye. I think Mr. Breen will see you now. You bet he'll see me. If he knows what's good for him. Stay out. What's the matter? 
Hydrophobia. <laughs> well, he's always glad to see me. Hey, listen, you. Did you hear what I said? I said no. Well, go ahead. Make it snappy. What do you want? Me? Oh, I just dropped in for a drink. Do you know better than to drop into a police station for a drink? I don't know what this country's coming to when a guy can't get a drink in a police station. Come on, scram. I'm busy. That's all right. You're not bothering me. See where your girlfriend Jerry's playing around with your old pal brain. Yeah, that's what's got me worried. Why don't you do something about it? I can't, Jim. I've talked to her till I'm blue in the face, but you know how a dame is. The more you knock a guy in, the more she's for him. I'm sorry for you, kid, but I got grief on my own. I'm not in so strong with the police commission. Hey, Chief. There's a Mr. Warner here to see Burton. Warner? To see you? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention it. I told him to meet me here. Say, what do you think this place is, the reception room? Listen, Jim, this guy may have a clue on the Breen case. He called me in my office, but I couldn't see him there on account of Jerry. Well, what's... What it's a... about the reward that, that my boss offered on the Garfield case, see? I wanted to hear him in case he has anything important to say. And what am I supposed to do? Play stenographer and take down a report of the conversation? No. You go in the other room and listen. I don't think a full view of that mug of yours will make anybody inclined to talk. Oh, is that so? Show him in, Casey. Huh? Come on, Mr. Winner. Right. Have a seat. I hope you don't mind my asking you to come here, but you see, there are reasons why I couldn't have you at the clinic. No privacy. It's all right with me. Besides, you might need the cops before you get through. Yeah. Well, Mr. Winner, what do you know? What do you know about Breen? Say, I know anything about Breen. I'm only a stockbroker's clerk. But I keep my eyes open. Yeah, but I thought that... I said I knew somebody connected with the Garfield murder. And maybe a few others. Well, as I told you over the phone, if you give us the right tip, there's 5,000 in it for you. Now, get this, Burton. I've got a date tonight with a certain party. If he treats me right, there's no story. Well, where do I come in? You're going to be at my house at 8.30 tonight. 5,000 bucks. Either I tell you the story and get the dough, or it's no sale. But there's the address. Remember, 8.30. Oh, and another thing. If you should get there before me, don't say anything to my mother. She thinks the party I'm dealing with is on the up and up. Well, we'll be there tonight at 8.30. Dave was expecting you. I think he's taking a nap. I'll, I'll go call him. Oh, yes, uh, upstairs. Well, I hope this is another wild goose chase. Well, anyway, it won't be a total loss. A good speakeasy in the same block. Find the wisecracks. Better get going. It's 8.10 now. Mrs. Werner. You happen to have the correct time. Me the time. I, I couldn't 
do, Viva. Well, you mustn't do that, Miss Wendell. Please. <laughs> Well, same as the others. He's dead. I knew it. I knew it! Oh. What are we going to do? Undoubtedly, we're in no brain secret. That's why Brain did away with him. Yeah, that's right. We're going to that skunk's house. Hey, what about her? We'll take her to the neighbors. Come on. Where's Breed? Why, he... Come on, Rat. Get up, Breen. I want to talk to you. I say, sir, you have no right. Shut up, you. I'll make my own right. Breen, you murdered Warner. We've got the goods on you. Mr. Breen says you'll talk to him civilly or you'll leave his house. Now, I'll talk to him civilly with a poke in the snoot. Breen, a man named Warner was murdered tonight. His mother will testify that you did it. Mr. Breen says, why don't you arrest him again and make yourself the laughing stocks you were in the Garfield case? Why, you? If you're innocent, how do you explain the people who will identify you as the man on the scene of the crime? Mr. Breen says, if you look at the matter calmly, it is easily explained. The watchman on the Garfield case was obviously drunk and might have identified anyone. And Mrs. Werner, after her son was murdered, probably had an hallucination caused by what she'd been reading in the papers. Uh. Mr. Breen is very sorry to hear of young Werner's death. He liked the boy immensely, and he will do all he can in order to help to bring the murderer to justice. Thanks. Breen, where were you tonight at 8.30? Mr. Breen has had a very bad cold. He lay down at 6 o'clock and slept until the gentleman wakened him. Uh-huh. Say, why should Breen have a piano if he can't hear music? Mr. Breen has the piano for the enjoyment of his guests. Oh, yeah. Come on, Jack. There's nothing else for us to do here. Good night, Mr. Breen. I'm sorry we disturbed you. Good night, gentlemen. Say. What do you make of it, Jim? 
I'd like to know how he could hear that piano when I couldn't get a tumble out of him firing off a gun. What makes you think he could hear me at the piano? I was watching him. He heard you all right. Oh, where does that get us? It gives me an idea. I'm going to sleep on it, and if I feel the same way in the morning, I'm putting the squad over here for a showdown. Yeah, but Chief. See me at my office at 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, listen, can't you give me a tip of some kind? No, I'm just stuck in the ball of Johnson's face. Well, now, listen, you know, I've been... That copper is onto something. I also found out that that reporter guy is sweet on the crane dame. If you don't look out, you're going to spoil a swell racket just on account of a skirt. Hello, boys. Hi, Casey. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Who do you want to see? Oh, Riley. I got a date with him this morning. Well, you won't see him. Yeah, who says so? I say so. He's dead. Riley? Dead? Yeah. The chief was found murdered early this morning. But where? How? You'll have to ask Hogan. He's been put in charge of the precinct. I should have known it. Riley was on the brain. He had to get him. How did it happen? Tell me about it. Riley's wife found him in bed at 7 o'clock. Strangled like the other guys. How could the murderer get to him? Easy. Alleyway and a fire escape leading to his bedroom window. Now I know it's Breen. Yeah? What are you going to do about it? Can't get anything on him. What a swell break I get. For 15 years, I've laid for this inspectorship, and now they hand it to me with five unsolved murders staring me in the face. What's the police commission got to say? They give me two weeks to find the murderer of Riley, or I'm canned. You can send in your resignation right now. If you get anything on Green, he'll take care of you just as quick as he took care of Riley. Yeah. I wonder why he went after Riley. Riley found out some kind of clue at Green's house last night. He's going to tell me about it this morning. Green got wise to him, bumped him off. What was you and Riley doing at Breen's house last night? We went up there on the Warner murder. Couldn't get the first page. And what's the lowdown on that Warner case? I was somewhere else. He got Warner for the same reason. Warner got wise to his secret. I tell you, that guy Breen's a maniac. He'll kill anybody who finds out about him. I wonder who else might stumble on to that guy's secret. He might just as well tip him off to stay away. Jerry Crane. What about her? I mean, she's been seeing Breen all the time. She might stumble onto his secret. I thought she was your girl. She used to be until this guy started working on her, hypnotizing her. I gotta do something. Say, wait a minute, let me talk to her. I got away with these things. Yeah, all right. Say, give me the Chronicle right quick. Yes, we know, but don't you realize the danger you're in? I'm sorry, Mr. Hogan, but I can't see it that way. I, I know Mr. Breen better than any of you. He couldn't possibly be guilty of the things you're talking about. But, Terry, dear, don't you understand? We've been working on this thing. We can see things you can't. Jack, you should know better. 
When people go snooping around with wild ideas in their mind, the first thing you know, they begin to believe them. As a matter of fact, you're asking me to believe the roughness things about one of the finest men I've ever met. We're not asking you to believe a thing. All we want you to do is to stop associating with Breen. What do you mean, associating with Breen? Well, everybody's been talking about it. It's even been in the newspapers. All these visits you've been making to his house. Which only means that the gossipers and columnists in the other papers are following in the footsteps of Mr. Burton at the Chronicle. <laughs> You're very foolish. Risking your life for a woman's whim. Why, this is no whim, and Jack knows it very well. I'm writing a series of articles on Mr. Breen. They're well paid, and I need the money badly. All right, then, chuck your articles. I'll give you what you need. But we've been through all that, Jack. How many more articles have you got to write? You've, you've written a dozen now for a guy who doesn't even write a short obituary. Well, that's really my business. Supposing I make it my business. Now, see here, Mr. Burton, I like Mr. Green, and I'm going to see him whenever I want to. But, Jerry, listen, honey, don't go now. Have dinner with me and talk it over. As a matter of fact, I'm having dinner with Mr. Green. What? Don't you realize that bird has bumped off two men in the last 24 hours? Don't that mean anything to you? What? Yes. No more than it would to Jack or any other reporter covering the assignment. Even if it were true. But, Jerry. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. If it'll make you feel any better, I'll ask Mr. Breen not to murder me. But, uh, Jerry, listen. Supposing you should stumble onto his secret. I won't, my dear. I'll pick my step. Hogan, I don't care what she says. She's liable to go up to the house tonight and never be heard of again. Ted Casey in here. We've got to do something. Calm down now and let me handle this, will you? You want me, Chief? Yeah, I want you and Sullivan to watch that Breen house. Jerry Crane's going over there tonight. If anything suspicious happens, telephone me here. Oh, thanks, Hogan. You're a pal. I'll go along with the boys and help him cover the house. And I'm going to get into a jam over this. Against the commission's order to have anybody watching us is suspected of a felony. Felony? Say, what do you think this is, a picnic? I don't like dames. I never did like dames. I'm going to get canned for protecting one when I ought to be giving her a good swift kick in the slacks. You're right, Chief. Dame just went in the house? Yeah. I was talking to Burton when she went by. Just our luck. She's a good looking dame. We'll have to, have to wait here for hours. Well, it's Hogan's orders. You better keep circling the block. But I'm finishing the articles, Mr. Green. I really don't think I should impose on you anymore. I can't see any reason why I should stop coming up here. You seem like an old friend whom I've known for years. Cigarette, Casey? Sure. Better walk. 
walk on. I got a hunch that guy spotted us. Well, so long. So long. I told you about that, Dane. There are a couple of bigs outside watching the house. Fort Hogan. Come on, Casey. Quick. A gentleman. Get in there. Train. Now listen to you, you shut up. What have you done with her? Casey, I'm going to search the house. Keep these two birds covered. Right. Hey, do you think I'm going to believe any of that junk you've been writing? Now, look here, I'm going to get the truth out of you if I have to choke it out of you. Any luck? Not a sign of her anyplace. The joint's empty. What's he say? Oh, that guy can lie fast as he can write. He doesn't have to come here at all tonight. Didn't you tell him we saw her come in? Yes, he says that's a maid, and she went out the back door. Say. If you know what's good for you, you'll come across. The minute I find out anything's happened to that girl, you'll be on the business end of a bullet.
Hey, can that racket. You just ain't got no ear for music. Besides, I think a lot better when I play. Yeah? Say, I got a hunch I've got the secret of this mystery right at my fingertips. I tell you, Jerry's right here in this house. Yeah, that's right. Say, didn't Riley say something about getting a clue around here? Yeah, he said something about Breen being able to hear the piano. Yeah. Well, I don't know what kind of a clue he'd get out of that. Yeah. Whoopsie. Look! Get that guy! Jerry. Take it easy. You all right? I'm just a bit shaky. Yeah, you take it easy there, boy. Oh, I told you not to trust this fellow, didn't I? Thought you said she wasn't here. The other guy's dead, Chief. Yeah? Watch him. They're just like as two peas in a pod. They can't both be deaf and dumb. I wonder which one of them we plugged. Hey, can you talk or can't you? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I won't believe a word you say. All right, gentlemen. I'm ready to talk. It's my duty to tell you that anything you might say will be used against you. Nothing will ever be used against me. No? Well, begin, and don't talk so much. Well, we're waiting. The mystery of the Sphinx, as you gentlemen of the press have done me the honor of calling me, should now be really quite obvious. Whenever I found it necessary to remove an obstacle, it was quite simple to establish a perfect alibi. My twin brother temporarily assumed my identity, and he being a real deaf mute, well, of course, would naturally discredit any witnesses who might testify that he had spoken to them. How successfully my little scheme worked to be attested to by the police departments of other cities beside your own. My only oversight was my inability to foresee an inspector with a talent for the piano. So you admit that you got Garfield, eh? Unfortunately, I did. I formed a stock pool with four other brokers with Garfield. They didn't like the way I did business and threatened to go to the district attorney. Well, I had to protect myself. Why, of course. And uh, Werner and Riley, what about them? One of us a skunk and tried to double cross me. Riley got suspicious about the piano. And uh, Jenks. Was he in on this? Where is that guy? <laughs> Jinx is miles away by now. <laughs> Suppose you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> 